This podcast series is supported by members at Patreon. If you want to support this podcast series, head to patreon.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. We all seek perfection in certain things. In the big leagues of commercial brewing, this is achieved through precise formulas that never stray far from the path. The trade-off can be losing touch with seasonality and nature itself, although there are still those among us who brew with nature and in harmony with the seasons. Welcome to the Cascadian Beer Podcast. My name's Aaron, and I'm a Cascadian. I have a background in radio and television broadcasting. I am a music producer and have a passion for beer. I don't consider myself to be an expert in beer by any means, but I do enjoy and respect the craft and the passion of these brewmasters. I want to learn from these pioneers on what sets them apart from the rest and why they choose to call Cascadia their home. Cascadia is a bioregion in the Pacific Northwest on the North American continent. It is made up of the U.S. states of Washington and Oregon, as well as the Canadian province of British Columbia. In this podcast series, I'll be profiling the unique breweries of Cascadia, a region that has a strong presence on the international beer scene. In this episode, I'm in Port Townsend, Washington, the gateway on the Olympic Peninsula to the Puget Sound. Started in 2012, Propolis Brewing focuses on traditional farmhouse ales, sourcing key ingredients from the local area. This brought together by the team of Robert Horner, I'm co-owner and the brewer here at Propolis. I'm Piper Corbett. And your title here? Brewess. Brewess. Yes. Awesome title. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it would be Alewife. Oh. And doesn't quite have the same ring. No, brew it, Brewess. <laughs> we'll, we'll stick with Brewess. How long have you uh, been established? Uh, I started Propolis in 2012, June. We really started brewing early 2013. So our first beers are vintage 2013. Yeah, it takes a long time to get a brewery going. Yeah. Were you uh, home brewing before then? Yeah, for many years, yeah. yeah. Been brewing uh, a little over a decade, really, by myself. But yeah, mm-hmm. started in the sink for the most part. <laughs> right. Now the sinks are just bigger. Right. <laughs> and we don't mind if we get it on the floor. Yeah. And there's definitely some craftiness about what we do here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're using a lot of botanicals. We're wild crafting. We're growing a lot of our own herbs and working with farmers. And with a name like Propolis, do you have your own hives? We don't have our own hives. It's definitely part of our dream. Um, but it's a work in progress. We started on a one barrel system mm-hmm. and we've taken everything we've made and put it back into our very small business and we have a humble beginning, and we have big dreams. So, well, so if you don't have hives, tell me about the name of Propolis then. Like, what is what is that meaning to the brewery? So Propolis is an antiseptic resin that protects the community of the hive. And specifically, it coats the entryway of the hive, and the bees disinfect their wings when entering the hive. It means before city. Propolis itself is a resin that is made out of trees and flowers and herbs and everything that grows year-round. So, in a way, there's a metaphor inside of a metaphor that's saying everything around us, when we use it in a particular way, protects our community. And so, we enforce these ideas by using 100% organic ingredients, when we do wild craft things like salmon berries and huckleberries, we make a point to save all of the seeds. And the seeds from the salmon berries and huckleberries are dried and replanted in restoration areas. And that's a really big part of our responsibility when we craft. We're really trying to infuse uh, our place into the, the, the ales we make influences you know the things i really liked to drink when i was you know growing up were the those nice tasty belgium french farmhouse ales you know Mm -hmm. the the farmhouse ales of europe you know some including some of those italian ones um i grew up in england you know drinking a lot of milds and bitters um but the the brewing history back there you know includes things like nettles and heather 
Mm-hmm. So moving to the States, you know, thinking about the brewing history of my heritage, I'm curious about what does a Heather beer taste like? And, and um, you know, there's there's various authors that have really written some great, great books on uh, herbal brewing um, that in, have been inspiring a, a new generation of, of grit, you know, the, the non-hopped ales, you know, just playing around with things, really, you know, trying to make a Heather beer because... I couldn't find one, you know, or trying to make an older flower beer because I couldn't find one. <clears throat> and then, you know, dialing it in to my own particular taste, what, you know, what tastes good, you know, going back to those those great kind of benchmark beers that, you know, like the old West Mall triple, you know, that's beautifully balanced beer that you can sit there and contemplate for a long time. And that's what I was inspired by, those sorts of beers. Mm-hmm. And we strive to create really interesting beers, but we don't really want to like smack you across the face with any particular flavor, especially not hops. So yeah. Yeah, you're not going to find a really hoppy beer here. But uh, with that said, we do use great Northwest organic hops and uh, other herbs, but we're mostly focused on celebrating the season um, and our place. So you're going to find things like nettles and spruce and cedar kind of infused in our beers. Yep. And you let everything age for a long time. So is, is like the time usually a year? Not, not necessarily. You know, some, some beers are enjoyed younger than others. Um, spruce, for instance, is really bright and crisp when it's young. And then it gets a little deeper and more resinous as you age it. They're both good. You know, we we say on a lot of our bottles, oh, you could age this for two years, three years. Um, mm-hmm. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy it now. Um, it just means that it's it's going to uh, stand up to time and um, mature gracefully, if you will. <laughs> so you're saying buy two. Buy two. <laughs> buy two or three. Yeah, yeah. Open, open one now. Yeah, yeah, we always encourage good. people to try it now. And, or else you don't even know what you're missing, right? You're right. Just, you're just waiting and waiting and waiting, and you could have missed a lot yeah. that you, you might have enjoyed. Um, but, you know, we do some some barrel aging, anywhere from three months to, to a year plus on those beers. But with that, we're looking for contributions from wild yeast and bacteria, and we're acidifying beer, mm-hmm. aging it, um, you know, in- incorporating some oak from the barrels and some of the nice tannins from some of the wines that you we get around here. We try to source our barrels locally as well. Are they new barrels or, eight, or used barrels? No, we... Or? we I've always used used barrels. We always right. incorporate used barrels. Yeah. We don't. Um, we like the neutrality of it. We don't want a lot of super heavy oak or wood. But there are you know great microorganisms in these barrels still. You know that we're getting that are. It's just a different culture. So each one of our barrels is a, its own little you know micro sphere of organisms that are unique to that barrel. So uh, we isolate a lot of wild cultures off of local fruit and um, plants and those are unique to the barrel so we we continue to use them over and over again we don't really kill things you know we 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 like them to keep evolving and we take a very controlled approach to that though the spent grain as well like go to farms and absolutely yeah Yeah, so we have all this gorgeous (laughs) organic spent grain we currently work with three different local pig farms, and some of it turns into chicken feed, and it goes together with other local resources we have here. We have a beautiful local creamery that has spent whey that's combined with our grain and uh, local spent apples. And so we have this uh, responsibility to our local ecosystem of small businesses that is creating food for our community. Mm-hmm. How important is that to you as a business to be giving back into the cycle, as it were, with all your spent product and and bringing that back into the brewery? Well, this is kind of a political question. (laughs) (laughs) How important is it for a business? Well, if a business is working independently, perhaps it is not the best use of time. But if you think of it as a conscious decision to support a local economy and support a local, again, ecosystem of businesses you make choices that are for the good of the whole and that's important to me as a person and this is our town port townsend i grew up here i've been here 32 odd years and i've watched the town change and evolve and i've watched plants and trees um, come and go i find it necessary to maintain the habitat that 
exists in Port Townsend and the surrounding areas. Why Port Townsend? Do you think you could do this anywhere else apart from Port Townsend as as the brewery? Or is it so important to you to be here in, in order to do this? I think every place has a story to tell. And in this part of the world, we're trying to tell our story through food and agriculture. And somehow we've supported this community of food and restaurants and businesses to continue to reinforce that. I think every place has a story to tell and the niche that we are feeding into is our story and our town and our place and the things that happen here. So every day, every week, something new is blooming and growing. And when it's right there, it's undeniable. And that's the beauty of of what we're doing is we're trying to capture that moment Mm -hmm. and say, now, pick me now, (laughs) turn me into a beer (laughs) (laughs) or something, you know, but celebrating what's happening that moment. And it doesn't happen the same every season, every year, it changes and being open to that and evolving with that and recognizing, you know, the different vintages of our beer from 2013, 14, 15, how, things have changed how the the berries have changed sometimes they're more earthy sometimes they're more bitter sometimes they're wonderfully sweet mm-hmm. you know but just and especially with the weather here if you had a sunnier summer you had absolutely. a cloudy summer yeah. embracing it and this yeah. is the real definition of terroir mm-hmm. what was that initial drive to make you go hey uh, there's something here i want to Want to open a beer? Yeah, I want, um, I want to actually make a brewery. Well, sure, it's the same uh, intrigue that a lot of home brewers have. They, you know, uh, they're a little more adventurous than the other beer drinkers. Mm-hmm. You know, they they uh, either can't find something that they're interested in, or they like something very much, but it might be very expensive, like mm-hmm. those really tasty Belgian beers that you find. You know, back when I started home brewing, there it was actually difficult to find. Uh, the beer selection that you have now. Now you walk into any neighborhood and you can find a well, any grocery um, store. Yeah, really. grocery yeah, yeah. Sh- grocery yeah. shops are, are yeah. outrageous nowadays. Yeah, you know you go to QFC and there's you know thousands of beers you can choose from. Yeah, even stuff from back east is yeah on the shelves. Yeah, yeah. and then the amount of breweries in the country now is staggering. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've seen the the awards on the shelf in there. How's that sense of accomplishment for you, just being recognized on that stage i don't think that i don't i don't know i can't i can't speak for robert i don't know that it's really registered for myself and i I don't know if it's registered for robert either we're just trying to stay focused on making our beer and what that means to the rest of the world i'm i'm not entirely sure i'm really excited if what we do influences the world to grow more organic grain, to grow more organic hops, and helps fuel uh, a bigger sense of food change. Mm -hmm. That's really important to me. How many awards have you received so far, and which awards have those been? I don't even know, really. Um, There's at least eight or nine. Um, Just local local craft brewing festival awards the washington state awards the jbf award um sip magazine always does a nice um best of the pacific northwest so we've won um three with those mostly focused in the belgium category um american brett so bretonomyces uh being a wild yeast we brew with a lot of bretonomyces a lot of our beers are mixed fermentation blended cultures and aged that's contributing a lot to the the kind of change that occurs in the bottle and in our kegs we keg condition and bottle condition so we we like to put our draft on as our bottles are released so you can you know if you're gonna drink beltane off of draft more than likely you're gonna taste the same evolution in the in the bottle yeah it'll be six months on draft it'll be six months in the bottle you wanted to tell me about this cherry tree that we're sitting under yeah so this is this is one of my favorite things about port townsend Cherries. I I love the cherries here, and these are old cherry trees. This, and yeah, this you can really honest, tell that this this tree's seen a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So where we are sitting is outside Propolis, and there's this gorgeous twisting 
cherry tree. And what this place used to be is this was the end of the railroad track, end of the line right here. Right. And at some point, they planted this tree. Anyhow, the cherry beer that we were inspired to make, the first cherry beer came from all of the cherry trees that we grew up with as kids. So all the trees that we love to climb and pick. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the fun of knowing and growing up in a place where you know where the best cherry tree is and the best blackberry is. So the first beer was us as adults climbing in trees that were made for kids (laughs) and picking about 450 pounds of local Port Townsend cherries. And how did that turn out? I think it's our best cherry beer. Is it, so it's still available? There are a few bottles, if you ask for the ones under the shelf. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go, the secret code. <laughs> <laughs> Say, I heard, it, I heard it on the podcast. May I have the cherry beer, please? Yeah. Then what about the salmon berries? The, the, do you source those from people, or do you actually go out and pick all those as well? Initially, we did a lot of picking ourselves, but... Uh, Over the years, we work with local wild crafters who value the seeds as well for restoration areas. So they work with us to pick, and then I help process the seeds. What's what's your favorite one to brew so far? Is there is there one that is just really complex that you just enjoy? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, they're all very different. You know, um, doing something like the Akalea, which is a more of a Belgium double, but finishes a little more like a dark saison. It's a little drier. Well, more rustic uses yarrow, so we're out picking the yarrow, so that adds a, a level of complexity to it, and um, and that kind of works its way into the beer. What is your favorite beard? Oh man, they're all your babies. How do you pick? I think coming out of the winter is really refreshing when many things are gone. You're using a lot of root herbs, and then the first wild nettles come up out of the ground. And the wild nettles come up and they're taking all these flavors with them, all the flavors of the dormant winter. And they're pulling up, you know, this lichen and moss and alder tree. And there's a vitality to that and a rebirth that I really enjoy. And when you're picking the nettles, you inevitably get stung by them. And that feeling is like, It's like scraping your knee when you're an adult and going, wow, that really hurt, but it really, I'm alive and that feels good, you know? Mm -hmm. Like remembering that you're human and you're touching something and that's really important to touch and pick and process. Mm -hmm. Um, Just connects you to a sense of time and a sense of place. That's important to me. I, I guess you're at the mercy of what nature's doing that year as well, right? If it's a drought or if, yeah. Yeah, you know, we did a, a red huckleberry one year, and then the next year the red huckleberries all fell off the bushes just in a matter of days. So we ended up doing a blue huckleberry, which is just it's different, you know. It's, um, and that's, you know, in the, in the wine barrels. Uh, we just processed a lot of local salmon berries, which is, uh, it's really a fun beer. It, that's, um, it's a barrel-aged beer that really does change you know depending on the fruit each year it's going to be very different the, the 2014 and 15 salmon berry is very much about the salmon berry um which I, it's uh, it's lovely it's just different yeah and you were telling me a story about birch mm. how do you how do you harvest the birch so again the birch is this wonderful little window of time where there's a particular period of two and a half, three weeks, where the birch tree pulls up uh, water from the ground and releases a sap that you can collect. And you have to collect it from the right tree so you're not hurting the tree, but it will let out a particular amount of syrup that you reduce 100 to 1, and then you can make a beer out of it. And it's a wild, woodsy, you know, the blood of the tree. And it's it's quite delicious mm-hmm. and it ages right now the bottles we have are like a champagne they're bone dry and they're tart and wild and birch tree it's a 
I, I haven't figured out words to describe what birch tastes like, but people who've tasted birch understand. Is there anything that you haven't done yet that's local that you're looking forward to just putting in a beer? I have so many containers <laughs> full of magical experiments. <laughs> Robert can't keep up with what we're creating. <laughs> so yeah, so then where does the idea if where does the idea come from then? Are you kind of the driver of of the experimentation and Robert's the mad scientist or is it kind mm. of equally both ways trying to make this happen? It's a balance. We're we're very different people, but we come together in very special ways. Robert is very hard working, incredibly hard working. 150 batches on a one barrel system last year and a lot of my work has to do with uh, foraging and finding these ingredients and helping to come up with new ideas would you ever consider doing something that doesn't grow locally in one of your beers but in the greater cascadia region that you can't source from here we certainly do there are some of our beers like our apricot beer mm -hmm. We're not growing here. However, this year, I saved all the apricot seeds <laughs> and I started sprouting them this spring. And because of the unexpected warm weather, I have apricots growing on the front porch of Propolis. You guys seem to be fairly busy and you have quite a wide reach. I looked at where you can get your beers and I saw a pin like way over in Chicago. Do you mostly focus on that and some select things kind of make their way out of the state or... Do you want to have that kind of strong reach across across we're, country? Actually, we're mostly focused on the Cascadian region right now. So we're focused on uh, California, uh, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. Uh, we've sent some things out to Chicago area. I mean, I gr grew up in, I was born and raised in England, but I grew up in uh, Illinois. So I had some connections back there, and, and we had some beer out there early. We've just now really gotten to a point where we can start to fulfill orders beyond our, you know, region here, the West Coast. We're just uh, now opening our, you know, opening and running this tap room, yep. and um, being able to offer more draft to local accounts. Um, you know, we're a little bit reserved in just launching out the door and sending beer all over the country. Yeah. Uh, not that I think we could. Um, we're. You know, currently on a 15 barrel system, but for three and a half years, I was on a one barrel system, right. brewing you know triples out in the wind and rain. And this is a great you know upgrade for us, and we're very happy at the scale. So, when did this upgrade take place? Then uh, the equipment here showed up really about mid February, late February is installed. So uh, we've just been brewing on it for yeah a few months now. And it's going great. Um, so there's a lot more flexibility. It's great. You know, we, we hope to be doing more of our beers that sell really great throughout the year. Like Beltane's a great example. Um, we, we do production on that throughout the year. But I'd say 75% of the beers we make are very specific to a unique season. So, you know, we just brewed and bottled, kegged spruce and Melissa, which is a lemon balm saison. And that's that's it. You know, it's it's going to be gone till next year. So, yeah, you can you can find it here. We do send some of those things out, but most of our barrel age beers and um, you know, there's under 20 cases of a lot of it. So we we tend to keep that here, and we 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 keep a lot of our vintages around. So each each vintage of a barrel age beer or a, a seasonal's uh, unique. It's different. The malt profile might have changed slightly to uh, work with the uh, herbs and what the herbs were doing or the fruit was doing if it was a big fruit year so we like to encourage people to try vertical tastings you know of um, vintages when you're not brewing what are some highlights in port townsend that really make you want to switch off and and then refocus on what you can be doing here honestly i think my favorite thing to do is to have the time and meditation to go out and forage and pick and it's just a very calming process to pick rose petals and 
hawthorns and these gorgeous seasonal things. It's a joy. It's a privilege. I'm really fortunate. What's been your favorite beer to pair with your favorite food? Well, there's a couple I really enjoy in thinking about the Pacific Northwest, just having not grown up here. You know, this is very uh, salmon-centric, you know, yeah. in, in the cuisine. And we like to encourage, you know... Um, some of the retail accounts that we work with uh, that are restaurant owners to come up with unique, interesting um, pairings for the, for the ales. The, the nettle ale, the urtica, is a really fun one to pair with food just because it, the flavors are just very unusual. You know, funnel tops and, and kind of grassy notes, forest flavors and very minerally. Um, but Cedar and spruce are both great with salmon. I, l- I really like the cedar. It's a bigger beer. It's an almost a Belgium triple, but again, it's kind of edging towards the saison. It's a little drier, more rustic condition with a little bread, so it's got that nice dry finish. But um, cedar and honey notes, and it just it pairs perfectly with the salmon. If you can get it on a cedar plank, you're even yeah. <laughs> you're, you're going the distance there. Yeah. Um, that's yeah, great. And what's your favorite beer of yours to pair with your favorite food? These are really tough questions. <laughs> You're good. I think the beer that I'm most proud of right now is a beer that I started two years ago with Robert. And it's Mahonia, and it's an Oregon great beer. It's another, you know, great terroir beer, deep elderberry notes cedar, rose petal, uh, bitterness from the Oregon grape, but balanced with the malt. And it is a wine, a wine of the forest. It's awesome antioxidant, vital. And it's very primal, and I really enjoy that beer. I would pair it with venison or reindeer if I could. (laughs) The other beer that inspires me is the salmonberry and the thimbleberry is my heart Um, very small batch we've made we haven't distributed it yet because thimbleberries are ridiculously small (laughs) and it takes a ton of them but they are the most delightful flavor and anybody who comes here to visit what would you like them to take home with them at the end of the day apart from apart from a bottle but What sort of experience or kind of background or understanding would you like them to take with them after visiting you? Well, going back to the idea of what is propolis, inside of this hive is a place of safety and a place of sanctuary and a place of reverence for what's happening, what's growing. So I want people to feel an opportunity to expand their palate and try things that they haven't tasted before and challenge themselves to understand different flavors in a different way. Well, thanks so much. I mean, course, I mean, your beers are absolutely beautiful. So. Thanks for coming over. Yeah. Huge thanks to Piper and Robert for taking the time out of their very busy schedules to speak with me. Normally, I would have some beers to recommend to you to try, but honestly, everything I had while I was there was so good and their rotation is so seasonal, you just have to pay them a visit and see. Piper and Robert run the tap room themselves and aren't afraid to blend their beers for you. If you just can't wait for your trip to Port Townsend to try their beers, have a look at their website to see if there's a stockist near you. Or better yet, join their beer club where you can get a different bottle from each season. Details at propolisbrewing.com. Honestly, you have to visit this place. They are doing such an amazing job you really have to try it for yourself. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Cascadian Beer Podcast. If you'd like to follow this series, head to cascadian.beer. You can also follow us at facebook.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. On Twitter, we're at Cascadian Beer. And also you can support this podcast series by going to patreon.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. Until next time, remember, support your local. <laughs>